Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Chapter Eleven. Sometimes, while meditating on these things in solitude, I got up in a sudden terror, and put on my bonnet to go see how all was at the farm. I have persuaded my conscience that it was a duty to warn him how people talked regarding his ways, and then I have recollected his confirmed bad habits, and hopeless of benefiting him, have flinched from re-entering the dismal house, doubting if I could bear to be taken at my word. One time I passed the old gate, going out of my way, on a journey to Gimmerton. It was about the period that my narrative has reached, a bright, frosty afternoon, the ground bare, and the road hard and dry. I came to a stone where the highway branches off onto the moor at your left hand, a rough sand-pillar with the letters W. H. cut on its north side, on the east G., and on the south-west T. G. It serves as a guide-post to the Grange, the Heights, and village. The sun shone yellow on its grey head, reminding me of summer. And I cannot say why, but all at once a gush of child sensations flowed into my heart. Hindley and I held it a favourite spot twenty years before. I gazed long at the weather-worn block, and, stooping down, perceived a hole near the bottom, still full of snail-shells and pebbles, which we were fond of storing there with more perishable things. And, as fresh as reality, it appeared that I beheld my early playmate seated on the withered turf, his dark square head bent forward, and his little hand scooping out the earth with a piece of slate. "'Poor Hindley!' I exclaimed involuntarily. I started. My bodily eye was cheated into a momentary belief that the child lifted its face and stared straight into mine. It vanished in a twinkling, but immediately I felt an irresistible yearning to be at the heights. Superstition urged me to comply with this impulse— Supposing he should be dead, I thought, or should die soon, supposing it were a sign of death. The nearer I got to the house, the more agitated I grew, and on catching sight of it, I trembled in every limb. The apparition had outstripped me. It stood looking through the gate. That was my first idea, on observing an elf-locked, brown-eyed boy, setting his ruddy countenance against the bars. Further reflection suggested this must be Hareton. My Hareton. Not altered greatly since I left him ten months since. "'God bless thee, darling!' I cried, forgetting instantaneously my foolish fears. "'Hareton, it's Nelly! Nelly, thy nurse!' He retreated out of arm's length, and picked up a large flint. "'I'm come to see thy father, Hareton,' I added, guessing from the action that Nelly, if she lived in his memory at all, was not recognised as one with me. He raised his missile to hurl it. I commenced a soothing speech, but could not stay his hand. The stone struck my bonnet, and then ensued— from the stammering lips of the little fellow, a string of curses, which, whether he comprehended them or not, were delivered with practised emphasis, and distorted his baby features into a shocking expression of malignity. You may be certain this grieved more than angered me. Fit to cry, I took an orange from my pocket, and offered it to propitiate him. He hesitated, and then snatched it from my hold, as if he fancied I only intended to tempt and disappoint him. I showed another, keeping it out of his reach. "'Who has taught you those fine words, my bairn?' I inquired. "'The curate?' "'Damn the curate, and thee! Give me that!' he replied. "'Tell us where you got your lessons, and you shall have it,' said I. "'Who's your master?' "'Devil, Daddy!' 
was his answer. "'And what do you learn from Daddy?' I continued. He jumped at the fruit. I raised it higher. "'What does he teach you?' I asked. Not, said he, "'but to keep out of his gate. Daddy cannot bide me because I swear at him.' "'Ah, and the devil teaches you to swear at Daddy?' I observed. "'Aye, nay,' he drawled. "'Who, then?' "'Heathcliff.' I asked if he liked Mr. Heathcliff. "'Aye,' he answered again. Desiring to have his reasons for liking him, I could only gather the sentences. "'I know. He pays Dad back what he gives to me. He curses Daddy for cursing me. He says I'm undo as I will.' "'And the curate does not teach you to read and write, then?' I pursued. "'No. I was told the curate should have his teeth dashed down his throat if he stepped over the threshold. Heathcliff had promised that.' I put the orange in his hand, and bade him tell his father that a woman called Nelly Dean was waiting to speak with him by the garden gate. He went up the walk and entered the house but instead of Hindley, Heathcliff appeared on the door-stones, and I turned directly and ran down the road as hard as ever I could race, making no halt till I gained the guide-post, and feeling as scared as if I had raised a goblin. This is not much connected with Miss Isabella's affair, except that it urged me to resolve further on mounting vigilant guard, and doing my utmost to check the spread of such bad influence at the Grange, even though I should wake a domestic storm by thwarting Mrs. Linton's pleasure. The next time Heathcliff came, my young lady chanced to be feeding some pigeons in the court. She had never spoken a word to her sister-in-law for three days, but she had likewise dropped her fretful complaining, and we found it a great comfort. Heathcliff had not the habit of bestowing a single unnecessary civility on Miss Linton, I knew. Now, as soon as he beheld her, his first precaution was to take a sweeping survey of the house-front. I was standing by the kitchen window, but I drew out of sight. He then stepped across the pavement to her and said something. She seemed embarrassed and desirous of getting away. To prevent it, he laid his hand on her arm. She averted her face. He apparently put some question which she had no mind to answer. There was another rapid glance at the house, and supposing himself unseen, the scoundrel had the impudence to embrace her. Judas! Traitor! I ejaculated. You are a hypocrite too, are you? A deliberate deceiver. Who is Nelly? said Catherine's voice at my elbow. I had been over intent on watching the pair outside to mark her entrance. Your worthless friend, I answered warmly. The sneaking rascal yonder. Ah, he has caught a glimpse of us, he is coming in. I wonder, will he have the heart to find a plausible excuse for making love to Miss, when he told you he hated her? Mrs. Linton saw Isabella tear herself free and run into the garden, and a minute after Heathcliff opened the door. I couldn't withhold giving some loose to my indignation, but Catherine angrily insisted on silence and threatened to order me out of the kitchen, if I dared to be so presumptuous as to put in my insolent tongue. "'To hear you, people might think you were the mistress,' she cried. "'You want setting down in your right place. Heathcliff, what are you about, raising this stir? I said you must let Isabella alone. I beg you will, unless you are tired of being received here.' "'and wish Linton to draw the bolts against you?' "'God forbid that he should try,' answered the black villain. "'I detested him just then.' "'God keep him meek and patient. "'Every day I grow madder after sending him to heaven.' "'Hush!'
said Catherine, shutting the inner door. "'Don't vex me! Why have you disregarded my request? Did she come across you on purpose?' "'What is it to you?' he growled. "'I have a right to kiss her if she chooses, and you have no right to object. I am not your husband. You needn't be jealous of me.' "'I'm not jealous of you.' "'replied the mistress. "'I'm jealous for you. "'Clear your face. "'You shan't scowl at me. "'If you like Isabella, you shall marry her. "'But do you like her? "'Tell the truth, Heathcliff. "'There, you won't answer. "'I'm certain you don't.' "'And would Mr. Linton approve of his sister marrying that man?' "'I inquired. "'Mr. Linton should approve.' "'returned my lady decisively. "'He might spare himself the trouble,' said Heathcliff. "'I could do as well without his approbation. "'And as to you, Catherine, "'I have a mind to speak a few words now while we are at it. "'I want you to be aware that I know you have treated me infernally. "'Infernally, do you hear?' and if you flatter yourself that I don't perceive it, you are a fool. And if you think I can be consoled by sweet words, you are an idiot. And if you fancy I'll suffer unrevenged, I'll convince you of the contrary in a very little while. Meantime, thank you for telling me your sister-in-law's secret. I swear I'll make the most of it, and stand you aside. "'What new phase of his character is this?' exclaimed Mrs. Linton in amazement. "'I've treated you infernally, and you'll take your revenge. "'How will you take it, ungrateful brute? "'How have I treated you infernally?' "'I seek no revenge on you,' replied Heathcliff less vehemently. "'That's not the plan.' The tyrant grinds down his slaves, and they don't turn against him. They crush those beneath them. You are welcome to torture me to death for your amusement. Only allow me to amuse myself a little in the same style, and refrain from insult as much as you are able. Having levelled my palace, don't erect a hovel and complacently admire your own charity in giving me that for a home. If I imagined you really wished me to marry Isabel, I'd cut my throat. "'Oh, the evil is that I am not jealous, is it?' cried Catherine. "'Well, I won't repeat my offer of a wife. It is as bad as offering Satan a lost soul. Your bliss lies like his in inflicting misery. You prove it. Edgar is restored from the ill temper he gave way to at your coming. I begin to be secure and tranquil, and you, restless to know us at peace, appear resolved on exciting a quarrel. Quarrel with Edgar, if you please, Heathcliff, and deceive his sister. You'll hit on exactly the most efficient method of revenging yourself on me. The conversation ceased. Mrs. Linton sat down by the fire, flushed and gloomy. The spirit which served her was growing intractable. She could neither lay nor control it. He stood on the hearth with folded arms, brooding on his evil thoughts. And in this position I left them to seek the master, who was wondering what kept Catherine below so long. "'Ellen,' said he, when I entered, "'have you seen your mistress?' "'Yes, she's in the kitchen, sir,' I answered. "'She's sadly put out by Mr. Heathcliff's behaviour, "'and indeed I do think it's time to arrange his visits on another footing. "'There's harm in being too soft, and now it's come to this.' "'And I related the scene in the court, and as near as I dared, "'the whole subsequent dispute.' I fancied it could not be very prejudicial to Mrs. Linton, unless she made it so afterwards by assuming the defensive for her guest. Edgar Linton had difficulty in hearing me to the close. 
his first words revealed that he did not clear his wife of blame. "'This is insufferable!' he exclaimed. "'It is disgraceful that she should own him for a friend, and force his company on me. Call me two men out of the hall, Ellen. Catherine shall linger no longer to argue with the low ruffian. I have humoured her enough.' He descended, and, bidding the servants wait in the passage, went, followed by me, to the kitchen. Its occupants had recommenced their angry discussion. Mrs. Linton, at least, was scolding with renewed vigour. Heathcliff had moved to the window and hung his head, somewhat cowed by her violent rating, apparently. He saw the master first, and made a hasty motion that she should be silent which she obeyed abruptly on discovering the reason of his intimation. "'How is this?' said Linton, addressing her. "'What notion of propriety must you have to remain here, after the language which has been held to you by that blackguard? I suppose, because it is his ordinary talk, you think nothing of it. You are habituated to his baseness, and perhaps imagine I can get used to it, too. "'Have you been listening at the door, Edgar?' asked the mistress, in a tone particularly calculated to provoke her husband, implying both carelessness and contempt of his irritation. Heathcliff, who had raised his eyes at the former speech, gave a sneering laugh at the latter. On purpose it seemed to draw Mr. Linton's attention to him. He succeeded, but Edgar did not mean to entertain him with any high flights of passion. "'I've been so far forbearing with you, sir,' he said quietly. "'Not that I was ignorant of your miserable, degraded character, but I felt you were only partly responsible for that.' and Catherine wishing to keep up your acquaintance, I acquiesced foolishly. Your presence is a moral poison that would contaminate the most virtuous. For that cause, and to prevent worse consequences, I shall deny you hereafter admission into this house, and give notice now that I require your instant departure. Three minutes' delay will render it involuntary and ignominious." Heathcliff measured the height and breadth of the speaker with an eye full of derision. "'Cathy, this lamb of yours threatens like a bull,' he said. "'It is in danger of splitting its skull against my knuckles. "'By God, Mr. Linton, I'm mortally sorry that you're not worth knocking down.' My master glanced towards the passage and signed me to fetch the men. He had no intention of hazarding a personal encounter. I obeyed the hint, but Mrs. Linton, suspecting something, followed, and when I attempted to call them, she pulled me back, slammed the door to, and locked it. "'Fair means,' she said, in answer to her husband's look of angry surprise. "'If you have not courage to attack him, make an apology, or allow yourself to be beaten.' "'It will correct you of feigning more valour than you possess. "'No, I'll swallow the key before you shall get it. "'I am delightfully rewarded for my kindness to each. "'After constant indulgence of one's weak nature and the other's bad one, "'I earn for thanks two samples of blind ingratitude, stupid to absurdity. "'Edgar, I was defending you and yours.' "'and I wish Heathcliff may flog you sick "'for daring to think an evil thought of me.' "'It did not need the medium of a flogging "'to produce that effect on the master. "'He tried to wrest the key from Catherine's grasp, "'and for safety she flung it into the hottest part of the fire. "'Whereupon Mr. Edgar was taken with a nervous trembling, "'and his countenance grew deadly pale.' For his life he could not avert that excess of emotion. Mingled anguish and humiliation overcame him completely. He leant on the back of a chair and covered his face. "'Oh, heavens, in old days this would win you knighthood!' exclaimed Mrs. Linton. 
We are vanquished, we are vanquished. Heathcliff would as soon lift a finger at you, as the king would march his army against a colony of mice. Cheer up, you shan't be hurt. Your type is not a lamb, it is a sucking leveret. I wish you joy of the milk-blooded coward, Cathy, said her friend. I compliment you on your taste, and that is the slavering, shivering thing you preferred to me. I would not strike him with my fist, but I'd kick him with my foot, and experience considerable satisfaction. Is he weeping, or is he going to faint for fear? The fellow approached, and gave the chair on which Linton rested a push. He'd better have kept his distance. My master quickly sprang erect, and struck him full on the throat, a blow that would have levelled a slighter man. It took his breath for a minute, and while he choked, Mr. Linton walked out by the back door into the yard, and from thence to the front entrance. "'There! You've done with coming here!' cried Catherine. "'Get away now! He'll return with a brace of pistols and half a dozen assistants. If he did overhear us, of course he'd never forgive you. You've played me an ill turn, Heathcliff. But go, make haste. I'd rather see Edgar at bay than you.' "'Do you suppose I'm going with that blow burning in my gullet?' he thundered. "'By hell, no! I'll crush his ribs in like a rotten hazelnut before I cross the threshold. If I don't floor him now, I shall murder him some time. So as you value his existence, let me get at him.' "'He is not coming,' I interposed, framing a bit of a lie. "'There's the coachman and the two gardeners. You'll surely not wait to be thrust into the road by them.' Each has a bludgeon, and Master Will very likely be watching from the parlour windows to see that they fulfil his orders. The gardeners and coachmen were there, but Linton was with them. They had already entered the court. Heathcliff, on the second thoughts, resolved to avoid a struggle against three underlings. He seized the poker, smashed the lock from the inner door, and made his escape as they tramped in. Mrs. Linton, who was very much excited, bade me accompany her upstairs. She did not know my share in contributing to the disturbance, and I was anxious to keep her in ignorance. "'I'm nearly distracted, Nelly,' she exclaimed, throwing herself on the sofa. "'A thousand smith's hammers are beating in my head. Tell Isabella to shun me. This uproar is owing to her.' and should she or any one else aggravate my anger at present, I shall get wild. And, Nelly, say to Edgar, if you see him again to-night, that I am in danger of being seriously ill. I wish it may prove true. He has startled and distressed me shockingly. I want to frighten him. Besides, he might come and begin a string of abuse or complainings. I am certain I should recriminate and God knows where we should end. Will you do so, my good Nelly? You are aware that I am no way blamable in this matter. What possessed him to turn listener? Heathcliff's talk was outrageous after you left us, but I could soon have diverted him from Isabella, and the rest meant nothing. Now all is dashed wrong by the fool's craving to hear evil of self that haunts some people like a demon. Had Edgar never gathered our conversation, he would never have been the worse for it. Really, when he opened on me, in that unreasonable tone of displeasure, after I had scolded Heathcliff till I was hoarse for him, I did not care hardly what they did to each other, especially as I felt that, however the scene closed, we should all be driven asunder, for nobody knows how long. Well, if I cannot keep Heathcliff for my friend, if Edgar will be mean and jealous, I'll try to break their hearts by breaking my own. That will be a prompt way of finishing all when I am pushed to extremity. But it's a deed to be reserved for a forlorn hope. 
I'd not take Linton by surprise with it. To this point he has been discreet in dreading to provoke me. You must represent the peril of quitting that policy, and remind him of my passionate temper, verging when kindled on frenzy. I wish you could dismiss that apathy out of that countenance, and look rather more anxious about me. The stolidity with which I received these instructions was, no doubt, rather exasperating, for they were delivered in perfect sincerity. But I believed a person who could plan the turning of her fits of passion to account beforehand might, by exerting her will, manage to control herself tolerably, even while under their influence, and I did not wish to frighten her husband, as she said and multiply his annoyances for the purpose of serving her selfishness. Therefore I said nothing when I met the master coming towards the parlour, but I took the liberty of turning back to listen whether they would resume their quarrel together. He began to speak first. "'Remain where you are, Catherine,' he said, without any anger in his voice, but with much sorrowful despondency. "'I shall not stay.' I am neither come to wrangle nor be reconciled, but I wish just to learn whether, after this evening's events, you intend to continue your intimacy with— Oh, for mercy's sake! interrupted the mistress, stamping her foot. For mercy's sake, let us hear no more of it now. Your cold blood cannot be worked into a fever. Your veins are full of ice water, but mine are boiling and the sight of such chillness makes them dance. To get rid of me, answer my question, persevered Mr. Linton. You must answer it, and that violence does not alarm me. I have found that you can be as stoical as any one when you please. Will you give up Heathcliff hereafter, or will you give up me? It is impossible for you to be my friend and his at the same time, and I absolutely require to know which you choose. "'I require to be let alone!' exclaimed Catherine furiously. "'I demand it! Don't you see I can scarcely stand? Edgar, you, you leave me!' She rang the bell till it broke with a twang. I entered leisurely. It was enough to try the temper of a saint such senseless wicked rages. There she lay, dashing her head against the arm of the sofa, and grinding her teeth, so that you might fancy she would crash them to splinters. Mr. Linton stood looking at her in sudden compunction and fear. He told me to fetch some water. She had no breath for speaking. I brought a glassful and as she would not drink, I sprinkled it on her face. In a few seconds she stretched herself out stiff, and turned up her eyes, while her cheeks, at once blanched and livid, assumed the aspect of death. Linton looked terrified. "'There is nothing in the world the matter,' I whispered. I did not want him to yield, though I could not help being afraid in my heart. "'She has blood on her lips,' he said, shuddering. "'Never mind,' I answered tartly. And I told him how she had resolved, previous to his coming, on exhibiting a fit of frenzy. I incautiously gave the account aloud, and she heard me, for she started up, her hair flying over her shoulders, her eyes flashing, the muscles of her neck and arms standing out preternaturally. I made up my mind for broken bones at least, but she only glared about her for an instant, and then rushed from the room. The master directed me to follow. I did, to her chamber door. She hindered me from going further by securing it against me. As she never offered to descend to breakfast next morning, I went to ask whether she would have some carried up. No, she replied peremptorily. The same question was repeated at dinner and tea, 
and again on the morrow after, and received the same answer. Mr. Linton, on his part, spent his time in the library, and did not inquire concerning his wife's occupations. Isabella and he had had an hour's interview, during which he tried to elicit from her some sentiment of proper horror for Heathcliff's advances, but he could make nothing of her evasive replies, and was obliged to close the examination unsatisfactorily, adding, however, a solemn warning that if she were so insane as to encourage that worthless suitor, it would dissolve all bonds of relationship between herself and him. CHAPTER Twelve. While Miss Linton moped about the park and garden, always silent and almost always in tears, and her brother shut himself up among books that he never opened, wearying, I guessed, with a continual vague expectation that Catherine, repenting her conduct, would come of her own accord to ask pardon and seek a reconciliation, and she fasted pertinaciously, under the idea, probably, that at every meal Edgar was ready to choke for her absence, and pride alone held him from running to cast himself at her feet. I went about my household duties, convinced that the Grange had but one sensible soul in its walls, and that lodged in my body. I wasted no condolences on Miss, nor any expostulations on my mistress nor did I pay much attention to the sighs of my master, who yearned to hear his lady's name, since he might not hear her voice. I determined they should come about as they pleased for me, and though it was a tiresomely slow process, I began to rejoice at length in a faint dawn of its progress, as I thought at first. Mrs. Linton, on the third day, unbarred her door, and having finished the water in her pitcher and decanter, desired a renewed supply, and a basin of gruel, for she believed she was dying. That I set down as a speech meant for Edgar's ears. I believed no such thing, so I kept it to myself, and brought her some tea and dry toast. She ate and drank eagerly, and sank back on her pillow again, clenching her hands and groaning. "'Oh, I will die!' she exclaimed, "'since no one cares anything about me. "'I wish I had not taken that.' "'Then a good while after I heard her murmur, "'No, I'll not die. "'He'd be glad. "'He does not love me at all. "'He would never miss me.' "'Did you want anything, ma'am?' I inquired still preserving my external composure, in spite of her ghastly countenance and strange, exaggerated manner. "'What is that apathetic being doing?' she demanded, pushing the thick, entangled locks from her wasted face. "'Has he fallen into a lethargy? Or is he dead?' "'Neither,' replied I, "'if you mean Mr. Linton. He is tolerably well, I think.' though his studies occupy him rather more than they ought, he is continually among his books, since he has no other society. I should not have spoken so if I had known her true condition, but I could not get rid of the notion that she acted a part of her disorder. "'Among his books!' she cried, confounded. "'And I, dying! I, on the brink of the grave!' "'My God! Does he know how I am altered?' continued she, staring at her reflection in a mirror hanging against the opposite wall. "'Is that Catherine Linton? He imagines me in a pet, in play, perhaps. Cannot you inform him that it is frightful earnest? Nelly, if it be not too late—' As soon as I learn how he feels, I'll choose between these two, either to starve at once, that would be no punishment unless he had a heart, or to recover and leave the country. Are you speaking the truth about him now? Take care. 
Is he actually so utterly indifferent for my life?' "'Why, ma'am,' I answered, "'the master has no idea of your being deranged, and of course he does not fear that you will let yourself die of hunger.' "'You think not? Cannot you tell him I will?' she returned. "'Persuade him! Speak of your own mind! Say you are certain I will!' "'No, you forget, Mrs. Linton,' I suggested, "'that you have eaten some food with a relish this evening, "'and to-morrow you will perceive its good effects.' "'If I were only sure it would kill him,' she interrupted, "'I'd kill myself directly. "'These three awful nights I've never closed my lids, "'and, oh, I've been tormented. "'I've been haunted, Nelly but I begin to fancy you don't like me. How strange! I thought, though everybody hated and despised each other, they could not avoid loving me, and they have all turned to enemies in a few hours. They are half unpositive, the people here. How dreary to meet death, surrounded by their cold faces! Isabella! terrified and repelled, afraid to enter the room. It would be so dreadful to watch Catherine go. And Edgar standing solemnly by to see it over, then offering prayers of thanks to God for restoring peace to his house, and going back to his books. What in the name of all that feels has he to do with books when I am dying? She could not bear the notion which I had put into her head of Mr. Linton's philosophical resignation. Tossing about, she increased her feverish bewilderment to madness, and tore the pillow with her teeth, then, raising herself up, all burning, desired that I would open the window. We were in the middle of winter, the wind blew strong from the north-east, and I objected. Both the expressions flitting over her face and the changes of her moods began to alarm me terribly, and brought to my recollection her former illness, and the doctor's injunction that she should not be crossed. A minute previously she was violent, now, supported on one arm, and not noticing my refusal to obey her, she seemed to find childish diversion in pulling the feathers from the rents she had just made and ranging them on the sheet according to their different species. Her mind had strayed to other associations. "'That's a turkey's,' she murmured to herself. "'And this is a wild duck's, and this is a pigeon's. Ah, they put pigeon's feathers in the pillows. No wonder I couldn't die. Let me take care to throw it on the floor when I lie down.' "'And here is a more cox, and this, I should know it among a thousand. "'It's a lapwings. "'Bonny bird, wheeling over our heads in the middle of the moor. "'It wanted to get to its nest, for the clouds had touched the swells, "'and it felt rain coming. "'This feather was picked up from the heath. "'The bird was not shot.' We saw its nest in the winter, full of little skeletons. Heathcliff set a trap over it, and the old ones dared not come. I made him promise he'd never shoot a lapwing after that, and he didn't. Yes, here are more. Did he shoot my lapwings, Nelly? Are they red, any of them? Let me look. "'Give over with that baby work,' I interrupted, dragging the pillow away, and turning the holes towards the mattress, for she was removing its contents by handfuls. "'Lie down and shut your eyes. You're wandering. There's a mess. The down is flying about like snow.' I went here and there, collecting it. "'I see in you, Nelly,' she continued dreamily. An aged woman, you have grey hair and bent shoulders. 
This bed is the fairy cave under Peniston Crags, and you're gathering elf bolts to hurt our heifers, pretending while I'm near that they're only locks of wool. That's what you'll come to fifty years hence. I know you are not so now. I am not wandering. You are mistaken, or else I should believe you really were that withered hag and I should think I was under Peniston Crags. And I'm conscious it's night, and there are two candles on the table, making the black press shine like jet. The black press? Where is that? I asked. You are talking in your sleep. It's against the wall, as it always is, she replied. It does appear odd. I see a face in it. There's no press in the room, and never was, said I, resuming my seat, and looping up the curtain that I might watch her. Don't you see that face? she inquired, gazing earnestly at the mirror. And say what I could, I was incapable of making her comprehend it to be her own so I rose and covered it with a shawl. "'It's behind there still,' she pursued anxiously. "'And it stirred. Who is it? I hope it will not come out when you are gone. Oh, Nelly, the room is haunted. I am afraid of being alone.' I took her hand in mine, and bid her be composed, for a succession of shudders convulsed her frame, and she would keep straining her gaze towards the glass. "'There's nobody here,' I insisted. "'It was yourself, Mrs. Linton. You knew it a while since.' "'Myself!' she gasped. "'And the clock is striking twelve. It's true, then. That's dreadful.' Her fingers clutched the clothes and gathered them over her eyes, I attempted to steal to the door with an intention of calling her husband, but I was summoned back by a piercing shriek. The shawl had dropped from the frame. "'Why, what is the matter?' cried I. "'Who is coward now? Wake up! That is the glass, the mirror, Mrs. Linton, and you see yourself in it, and there am I, too, by your side.' Trembling and bewildered, she held me fast, but the horror gradually passed from her countenance. Its paleness gave place to a glow of shame. "'Oh, dear! I thought I was at home,' she sighed. "'I thought I was lying in my chamber at Wuthering Heights. Because I am weak, my brain got confused, and I screamed unconsciously. Don't say anything, but stay with me. I dread sleeping, my dreams appall me. A sound sleep would do you good, ma'am, I answered, and I hope this suffering will prevent your trying starving again. Oh, if I were but in my own bed in the old house, she went on bitterly, wringing her hands, and that wind sounding in the firs by the lattice. Do let me feel it. It comes straight down the moor. Do let me have one breath. To pacify her, I held the casement ajar a few seconds. A cold blast rushed through. I closed it and returned to my post. She lay still now, her face bathed in tears. Exhaustion of body had entirely subdued her spirit. Our fiery Catherine was no better than a wailing child. "'How long is it since I shut myself in here?' she asked, suddenly reviving. "'It was Monday evening,' I replied, "'and this is Thursday night, or rather Friday morning, at present.' "'What, of the same week?' she exclaimed. "'Only that brief time?' "'Long enough to live on nothing but cold water and ill-temper,' observed I. "'Well, it seems a weary number of hours,' 
she muttered doubtfully. "'It must be more. I remember being in the parlour after they had quarrelled, and Edgar being cruelly provoking, and me running into this room desperate. As soon as ever I had bowed the door, utter blackness overwhelmed me, and I fell on the floor. I couldn't explain to Edgar how certain I felt of having a fit or going raging mad if he persisted in teasing me. I had no command of tongue or brain, and he did not guess my agony, perhaps. It barely left me sense to try to escape from him and his voice. Before I recovered sufficiently to see and hear, it began to be dawn, and, Nelly, I'll tell you what I thought, and what has kept recurring and recurring till I feared for my reason. I thought, as I lay there, with my head against that table leg, and my eyes dimly discerning the grey square of the window, that I was enclosed in the oak-panelled bed at home, and my heart ached with some great grief, which, just waking, I could not recollect. I pondered and worried myself to discover what it could be, and, most strangely, the whole last seven years of my life grew a blank. I did not recall that they had been at all. I was a child. My father was just buried, and my misery arose from the separation that Hindley had ordered between me and Heathcliff. I was laid alone for the first time, and rousing from a dismal doze after a night of weeping, I lifted my hand to push the panels aside. It struck the table-top. I swept it along the carpet, and then memory burst in. My late anguish was swallowed in a paroxysm of despair. I cannot say why I felt so wildly wretched. It must have been temporary derangement, for there is scarcely cause. But supposing at twelve years old I had been wrenched from the heights and every early association and my all in all, as Heathcliff was at that time, and been converted at a stroke into Mrs. Linton, the lady of Thrushcross Grange, and the wife of a stranger, an exile and outcast thenceforth from what had been my world. You may fancy a glimpse of the abyss where I grovelled. Shake your head as you will, Nelly. You have helped to unsettle me. You should have spoken to Edgar, indeed you should, and compelled him to leave me quiet. Oh, I'm burning. I wish I were out of doors. I wish I were a girl again, half savage and hardy and free and laughing at injuries, not maddening under them. Why am I so changed? Why does my blood rush into a hell of tumult at a few words? I'm sure I should be myself were I once among the heather on those hills. Open the window again, wide. Fasten it open. Quick! Why don't you move? Because I won't give you your death of cold, I answered. You won't give me a chance of life, you mean, she said sullenly. However, I'm not helpless yet. I'll open it myself. And sliding from the bed before I could hinder her, she crossed the room, walking very uncertainly, threw it back and bent out, careless of the frosty air that cut about her shoulders as keen as a knife. I entreated, and finally attempted to force her to retire. But I soon found her delirious strength much surpassed mine. She was delirious, and became convinced by her subsequent actions and ravings. There was no moon, and everything beneath lay in misty darkness. Not a light gleamed from any house. Far or near, all had been extinguished long ago. 
and those at Wuthering Heights were never visible. Still she asserted she caught their shining. "'Look!' she cried eagerly. "'That's my room with the candle in it, and the trees swaying before it, and the other candle is in Joseph's garret. Joseph sits up late, doesn't he? He's waiting till I come home that he may lock the gate. Well, he'll wait a while yet. It's a rough journey, and a sad heart to travel it, and we must pass by Gimmerton Kirk to go that journey. We've braved its ghosts often together, and dared each other to stand among the graves and ask them to come. But Heathcliff, if I dare you now, will you venture? If you do, I'll keep you. I'll not lie there by myself. They may bury me twelve feet deep and throw the church down over me, but I won't rest till you are with me. I never will. She paused and resumed with a strange smile. He's considering. He'd rather I'd come to him. Find a way, then, not through that kirkyard. You are slow. Be content, you always followed me. Perceiving it vain to argue against her insanity, I was planning how I could reach something to wrap about her without quitting my hold of herself, for I could not trust her alone by the gaping lattice, when, to my consternation, I heard the rattle of the door-handle, and Mr. Linton entered. He had only then come from the library, and in passing through the lobby had noticed our talking, and been attracted by curiosity or fear to examine what it signified at that late hour. "'Oh, sir!' I cried, checking the exclamation risen to his lips at the sight which met him, and the bleak atmosphere of the chamber. "'My poor mistress is ill, and she quite masters me. I cannot manage her at all. Pray come and persuade her to go to bed. Forget your anger, for she's hard to guide any way but her own.' "'Catherine ill?' he said, hastening to us. "'Shut the window, Ellen. Catherine, why—' He was silent. The haggardness of Mrs. Linton's appearance smote him speechless, and he could only glance from her to me in horrified astonishment. "'She's been fretting here,' I continued, "'and eating scarcely anything, and never complaining. She would admit none of us till this evening, and so we couldn't inform you of her state, as we were not aware of it ourselves. But it is nothing.' I felt I uttered my explanations awkwardly. The master frowned. "'It is nothing, is it, Ellen Dean?' he said sternly. "'You shall account more clearly for keeping me ignorant of this.' And he took his wife in his arms and looked at her with anguish. At first she gave him no glance of recognition. He was invisible to her abstracted gaze. The delirium was not fixed, however, having weaned her eyes from contemplating the outer darkness, by degrees she centred her attention on him, and discovered who it was that held her. "'Ah, you are come, are you, Edgar Linton? she said with angry animation. "'You are one of those things that are ever found when least wanted, and when you are wanted, never.' I suppose we shall have plenty of lamentations now. I see we shall. But they can't keep me from my narrow home out yonder. My resting place, where I'm bound before spring is over. There it is. Not among the Linton's mind, under the chapel roof. But in the open air with a headstone. And you may please yourself whether you go to them or come to me. "'Catherine, what have you done?' commenced the master. "'Am I nothing to you any more? Do you love that wretch he's—' "'Hush!' cried Mrs. Linton. "'Hush this moment! "'You mention that name, and I end the matter instantly by a spring from the window. 
what you touch at present you may have but my soul will be on that hilltop before you lay hands on me again i don't want you edgar i am past wanting you return to your books i'm glad you possess a consolation for all you had in me is gone her mind wanders sir i interposed she has been talking nonsense the whole evening but let her have quiet and proper attendance and she'll rally hereafter we must be cautious how we vex her i desire no further advice from you answered mr linton you knew your mistress's nature and you encouraged me to harass her and not to give me one hint of how she has been these three days it was heartless months of sickness could not cause such a change i began to defend myself thinking it too bad to be blamed for another's wicked waywardness i knew mrs linton's nature to be headstrong and domineering cried i but i didn't know that you wished to foster her fierce temper i didn't know that to humour her i should wink at mr heathcliff i have performed the duty of a faithful servant in telling you and i've got a faithful servant's wages well it will teach me to be careful next time next time you may gather intelligence for yourself the next time you bring a tale to me you shall quit my service ellen dean he replied you'd rather hear nothing about it i suppose then mr linton said i heathcliff has your permission to come a-courting to miss and to drop in at every opportunity your absence offers on purpose to poison the mistress against you confused as catherine was her wits were alert at applying our conversation ah nelly has played traitor she exclaimed passionately nelly is my hidden enemy you witch so you do seek elf bolts to hurt us let me go and i'll make her rue i'll make her howl a recantation a maniac's fury kindled under her brows she struggled desperately to disengage herself from linton's arms i felt no inclination to tarry the event and resolving to seek medical aid on my own responsibility i quitted the chamber in passing the garden to reach the road at a place where a bridle-hook is driven into the wall i saw something white moved irregularly evidently by another agent than the wind notwithstanding my hurry i stayed to examine it lest ever after i should have the conviction impressed on my imagination that it was a creature of the other world my surprise and perplexity were great on discovering by touch more than vision miss isabella's springer fanny suspended by a handkerchief and nearly at its last gasp i quickly released the animal and lifted it into the garden i had seen it follow its mistress upstairs when she went to bed and wondered much how it could have got out there and what mischievous person had treated it so while untying the knot round the hook it seemed to me that i repeatedly caught the beat of horses feet galloping at some distance but there were such a number of things to occupy my reflections that i hardly gave the circumstance a thought though it was a strange sound in that place at two o'clock in the morning mr kenneth was fortunately just issuing from his house to see a patient in the village as I came up the street, and my account of Catherine Linton's malady induced him to accompany me back immediately. He was a plain, rough man, and he made no scruple to speak his doubts of her surviving this second attack, unless she were more submissive to his directions than she had shown herself before. "'Nelly Dean,' said he, "'I can't help fancying there's an extra cause for this.' what has there been to do at the grange we've odd reports up here a stout hearty lass like catherine does not fall ill for a trifle 
and that sort of people should not, either. It's hard work bringing them through fevers and such things. How did it begin?' "'The master will inform you,' I answered. "'But you were acquainted with the Earnshaw's violent dispositions, and Mrs. Linton caps them all. I may say this, it commenced in a quarrel. She was struck during a tempest of passion with a kind of fit. That's her account, at least, for she flew off in the height of it and locked herself up. Afterwards she refused to eat, and now she alternately raves and remains in a half-dream, knowing those about her but having her mind filled with all sorts of strange ideas and illusions. "'Mr. Linton will be sorry,' observed Kenneth interrogatively. "'Sorry? He'll break his heart should anything happen,' I replied. "'Don't alarm him more than necessary.' "'Well, I told him to beware,' said my companion, "'and he must bide the consequences of neglecting my warning. "'Hasn't he been intimate with Mr. Heathcliff lately?' "'Heathcliff frequently visits at the Grange,' answered I, "'though more on the strength of the mistress having known him when a boy "'than because the master likes his company. "'At present he's discharged from the trouble of calling, "'owing to some presumptuous aspirations after Miss Linton, which he manifested. "'I hardly think he'll be taken in again.' "'And does Miss Linton turn a cold shoulder on him?' was the doctor's next question. "'I'm not in her confidence,' returned I, reluctant to continue the subject. "'No, she's a sly one,' he remarked, shaking his head. "'She keeps her own counsel. But she's a real little fool. I have it from good authority that last night, and a pretty night it was, she and Heathcliff were walking in the plantation at the back of your house above two hours, and he pressed her not to go in again, but just mount his horse and away with him. My informant said she could only put him off by pledging her word of honour to be prepared on their first meeting after that. When it was to be, he didn't hear, but you urge Mr. Linton to look sharp. This news filled me with fresh fears, I outstripped Kenneth and ran most of the way back. The little dog was yelping in the garden yet. I spared a minute to open the gate for it, but instead of going to the house door, it coursed up and down, snuffing the grass, and would have escaped to the road had I not seized it and conveyed it in with me. On ascending to Isabella's room, my suspicions were confirmed. It was empty. Had I been a few hours sooner, Mrs. Linton's illness might have arrested her rash step. But what could be done now? There was a bare possibility of overtaking them if pursued instantly. I could not pursue them, however, and I dared not rouse the family and fill the place with confusion. Still less unfold the business to my master, absorbed as he was in his present calamity and having no heart to spare for a second grief. I saw nothing for it but to hold my tongue and suffer matters to take their course, and Kenneth being arrived, I went with a badly composed countenance to announce him. Catherine lay in a troubled sleep. Her husband had succeeded in soothing the excess of frenzy. He now hung over her pillow watching every shade and every change of her painfully expressive features. The doctor, on examining the case for himself, spoke hopefully to him of its having a favourable termination, if we could only preserve around her perfect and constant tranquillity. To me he signified the threatening danger was not so much death as permanent alienation of intellect. I did not close my eyes that night, nor did Mr. Linton. Indeed, we never went to bed, and the servants were all up long before the usual hour, moving through the house with stealthy tread, and exchanging whispers as they encountered each other in their vocations. Everyone was active but Miss Isabella, 
and they began to remark how sound she slept. Her brother, too, asked if she had risen, and seemed impatient for her presence, and hurt that she showed so little anxiety for her sister-in-law. I trembled lest he should send me to call her, but I was spared the pain of being the first proclaimant of her flight. One of the maids, a thoughtless girl who had been on an early errand to Gimmerton, came panting upstairs, open-mouthed, and dashed into the chamber, crying, "'Oh, dear, dear! What mun we have next? Master, master, our young lady! Hold your noise!' cried I hastily, enraged at her clamorous manner. "'Speak lower, Mary. What is the matter?' said Mr. Linton. "'What ails your young lady?' "'She's gone! She's gone! Your knees cliffs run off with her!' gasped the girl. "'That is not true!' exclaimed Linton, rising in agitation. "'It cannot be! How has the idea entered your head? Ellen Dean, go and seek her. It is incredible! It cannot be!' As he spoke, he took the servant to the door, and then repeated his demand to know her reasons for such an assertion. "'Why, oh, I met on the road a lad that fetches milk here,' she stammered, "'and he asked whether we weren't in trouble at Grange. I thought he meant for Mrs. Sickness, so I answered yes. Then says he, "'There's somebody gone after him, I guess.' I stared. He saw I knew nought about it, and he told our gentleman and lady— had stopped to have a horse's shoe fastened at a blacksmith shop two miles out of Gimmerton, not very long after midnight, and how the blacksmith's lass had got up to spy who they were, she knew them both directly, and she noticed the man. Heathcliff it was, she felt certain, nobody could mistake him besides, put a sovereign in her father's hand for payment. The lady had a cloak about her face, but having desired a sup of water, while she drank it fell back and she saw her very plain. Heathcliff held both bridles as they rode on, and they set their faces from the village, and went as fast as the rough roads would let them. The lass said nothing to her father, but she told it all over Gimmerton this morning. I ran and peeped for form's sake into Isabella's room, confirming when I returned the servant's statement. Mr. Linton had resumed his seat by the bed. On my re-entrance he raised his eyes, read the meaning of my blank aspect, and dropped them without giving an order or uttering a word. "'Are we to try any measures for overtaking and bringing her back?' I inquired. "'How should we do?' "'She went of her own accord,' answered the master. "'She had a right to go, if she pleased.' "'Trouble me no more about her. "'Hereafter she is only my sister in name, "'not because I disown her, "'but because she has disowned me.' "'And that was all he said on the subject. "'He did not make single inquiry further, "'or mention her in any way, "'except directing me to send what property she had in the house "'to her fresh home, wherever it was, when I knew it.' 